The Saturn V was power incarnate. Five roaring F1 engines lifting six million pounds of fuel, hardware, and human hope. But as propellant burned away, that same power became a threat. Every second after liftoff, the rocket grew lighter, yet its engines kept thrusting just as hard. Acceleration rose, 3G, then 4. Left unchecked, the vehicle could literally crush itself, bending and buckling under its own power. So NASA's engineers taught the Saturn V to control its strength. They built a logic that could sense its own acceleration, measure its limits, and decide when to ease the load. And at 2 minutes and 15 seconds into flight, the brain of the rocket, the instrument unit, quietly commanded a single act of self-preservation. Shut down the center engine. The result was choreography, not chaos, a precise dance between fire, structure, and guidance. This is the story of how the world's most powerful machine stayed within its own limits and reached the moon. Every launch begins with a battle against air. As the Saturn V climbs, the atmosphere fights back until the moment of maximum dynamic pressure, max Q, around 66 seconds after liftoff. At that instant, aerodynamic stress peaks near 700 pounds per square foot, approximately 3.4 kilopascals. Flight controllers at Marshall and Kennedy monitor that value on their consoles. It defines how hard the air is pushing against a 364-foot tower of fire. But max Q isn't the moment of maximum acceleration. Once the air thins, drag drops away, yet the five F1 engines keep delivering 7.5 million pounds of thrust. As fuel mass falls from about 5.1 million pounds at liftoff to roughly 3 million by stage separation, the math is merciless. F equals M times A. Same thrust, less mass, more acceleration. By the two-minute mark, the crew in the command module would feel nearly four times their weight. For the structures beneath them, thin aluminum skins, interstages of honeycombed sandwich panels, and a delicate guidance ring, those forces could be fatal. At Marshall Space Flight Center, teams led by Dr. Eberhard Rees and Structural Chief Arthur Rausch used giant hydraulic load fixtures to simulate the pressure. If the center engine kept burning to depletion, compression at the top of the first stage could increase by hundreds of thousands of pounds. They needed a way to command strength, not just build it in. Resting like a white band between the second and third stages was the instrument unit, the IU. Only three feet high, it was the nervous system of the Saturn V. Inside its curved walls lived three marvels of engineering. The ST-124M3 stabilized platform, a gyroscopic heart that sensed every tilt and twist. The launch vehicle digital computer, the LVDC, built by IBM Federal Systems Division in Huntsville. And the data control equipment, that sent commands to every engine and valve. Before each launch, technicians aligned the platform with optical theodolites and quartz prisms from the mobile service structure. Once the tower cleared, the IU was on its own, a self-contained reference in three axes, steady to within 0.01 degree. The ST-124's gyros floated on films of nitrogen gas only 20 micro-inches thick. Accelerometers inside the beryllium frame registered changes as tiny as one ten-thousandth of a G. 
every pulse of motion flowed to the LVDC, a fully redundant computer with 16-bit logic and a reliability goal of one failure per billion operations. At IBM's Huntsville plant, workers in white smocks hand-wired its modules and ran weeks of vibration tests inside thermal vacuum chambers. Each unit was spun on a 20-foot rate table to prove it could track motion in all three axes. Through this network of sensors and circuits, the rocket felt the world, its motion, its acceleration, its stress. From those signals, the LVDC computed velocity, position, and longitudinal acceleration in real time. When that value crossed a predicted limit, the computer did not ask for permission, it acted. At T plus 2 minutes 15 seconds, the data streams reached their threshold. The LVDC issued a binary command through redundant relays in the instrument unit's control section. Center engine cutoff. Instantly, five F1 engines became four. Acceleration fell from nearly 4G to about 3. Inside mission control, a green indicator lit. SECO confirmed. This was no timer-based event. It was a live decision based on telemetry integration from the accelerometers. The system compared actual longitudinal acceleration with the guidance profile programmed before flight. Once the values converged, the shutdown signal was sent. By cutting one engine early, engineers prevented the upper stages, the S-2, S-4B, and the 100,000-pound Apollo spacecraft from being compressed beyond their limits. The remaining four outboards burned until T plus 240 when optical low-level sensors inside the tanks registered propellant depletion. In that fraction of a second, the instrument unit commanded four events. Engine shutdown, stage separation, ullage ignition, and second stage start. To the public, it looked effortless, one stage handing off to the next. But to the engineers, it was a moment of nervous silence as telemetry confirmed success. In that handful of lines of binary code, they had tamed a volcano. The Saturn V's frame was a study in opposites. Light yet strong. Aluminum alloys only 0.07 inch thick carried loads that would crush a battleship. At liftoff, compression through the S1C and S2 interstage exceeded 7 million pounds. As acceleration rose, so did stress. At Marshall, engineers mounted a full-scale interstage on a hydraulic vibration stand to measure bending modes. They found that if the center engine stayed on until propellant depletion, axial load at the instrument unit support ring could increase by 30 to 40 percent. That was unacceptable. By programming CE Co, they flattened the acceleration curve and kept bending moments within the structural margin. Telemetry from Apollo 8 and 11 later confirmed it. The actual loads never exceeded the predicted envelope. When you watch the film of a Saturn V rising, you can see the benefit in motion. The vehicle flexes gently, but never whips. It was a controlled dance of tons and inches. Inside the instrument unit, temperature sensors tracked heat from the S2 engine plume below, while shock mounts protected the delicate gyros from vibration. Every flight recorder confirmed the system stayed within safe temperature and stress limits. Above the separation fireball, five J2 engines ignited on liquid hydrogen and oxygen. The S2 stage produced another one million pounds of thrust, pushing the mission toward space. 
Roughly six minutes into flight, the instrument unit commanded the S2 center engine cutoff as well, but for a different reason. A phenomenon called pogo oscillation, a cyclic surge in propellant flow that fed back into thrust, had threatened to tear earlier vehicles apart. Apollo 6 in 1968 experienced pogo vibrations of plus or minus 0.6 g, nearly destroying the stage. Engineers installed helium accumulators and tuned valves to dampen the effect, but the most reliable fix was to shut the center engine off early. By reducing frequency symmetry, they eliminated the resonance mode. Once again, intelligence triumphed over brute force. The same instrument unit that watched the first stage burn was now supervising the second. Its data flowing through miles of shielded wiring and redundant relays. As the S2 burned out around T plus nine minutes, acceleration rose to just under 4G, then dropped to near zero as the S4B took over. The crew felt weightless for the first time, but the instrument unit was still working, tracking, calculating, commanding. From ignition to orbit, the Saturn V walked a razor's edge between brute force and fragile precision. Its engines never throttled, yet its mind did. Through sensors and software, it kept every flight within a narrow band of safety. No more than 3.9 G on the crew. No excess compression on the upper structure. No uncommanded bending modes. The engineers behind this logic worked with slide rules and analog simulators the size of rooms. They calculated in imperial fractions and binary pulses, and they got it right every time. Between 1967 and 1973, the Saturn V flew 13 times. Not one failed to reach space. That record remains unmatched. Power alone doesn't reach the moon. Control does. The instrument unit, that silent ring of machined aluminum and logic modules, wasn't just a guidance system, it was the conscience of the Saturn V. Every mission, it decided when enough was enough, and in doing so, kept Apollo's path true and survivable. When the last Saturn V left Earth on Skylab in 1973, that same logic lived on in every launch vehicle that measures, limits, and corrects itself. The concept survives today inside rockets like the SLS and Falcon 9, computers sensing acceleration, holding loads with intolerance, just as the IU once did. Because in spaceflight, the ultimate strength isn't brute force, it's knowing your own limits and mastering them.